This is True Crime Out Loud. I'm your host, B. And I'm your host, Jen. And this week's case does involve some graphic images. So if you're watching our podcast on YouTube or if you visit the website to look at the supporting materials, just be aware that these images can be disturbing to some viewers and listeners. The case this week is an older case that takes place in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And we'll tell you a little more about Philadelphia, PA. It is the largest city in Pennsylvania and it is rich in U.S. history. It is where the Declaration of Independence was signed in 1776. It's the location of the Liberty Bell and 67 other national historic landmarks. Its current population is about 1.5 million residents, but at the time of this case in 1957, there was about 2 million residents in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. To narrow it down even further, the case actually takes place in the Fox Chase area of Philadelphia, and that's a neighborhood in northeast Philadelphia. The population of Fox Chase is around 22,000. So let's go back to Monday, February 25th, 1957. And currently that is over 64 years ago as of 2021. It was a cold day, and it had been raining on and off prior to this day. The police were called to the Fox Chase area of Philadelphia in a wooded area that was off of Susquehanna Road and in the 700 block. A man called to report that there might be a child in a cardboard box in the thicket and wooded area. So the police respond to the area, and they find exactly that. There was a naked young boy deceased inside a cardboard box. He had been wrapped in a printed blanket. So the police are obviously alarmed, and they're horrified. They begin their investigation, and they start with the person who reported this. And it was a man named Frederick Benonis. Frederick was a 26-year-old college student at LaSalle College where he was a junior. He said he saw a rabbit run into the thicket and he knew that there were animal traps in the area. So he went into the thicket trying to save the rabbit. Yeah, and it doesn't take a background in law enforcement, which our listeners know that Jen and I both have. For this story to sound a little bit fishy, it's just, I don't know. I would immediately, I would immediately, if I was an investigator, have an issue with this story. Well, they did because his story is questioned later and we'll discuss that in a minute. What he said is he saw a large cardboard box with one end of it open and it looked like there was a doll inside. The head and shoulders of this doll were partially showing. He went home and he did not report it when he first saw it. But then he heard a radio broadcast of a missing child on this same day. And this radio broadcast was about a four-year-old named Mary Jane Barker. She had gone missing along with a neighbor's dog in New Jersey. Now, We're in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, but New Jersey is only about 15 minutes away. The police, however, quickly ruled out that the child in the box was Mary Jane Barker because the child in the box was a male. Now, Mary Jane was found on March 3rd. She was deceased in a closet in a vacant house along with the dog. When she is found... The dog comes running out of the closet and is still alive, but what they determine happened to Mary Jane is that she died on or around February 28th from starvation and exposure. She had gotten into this closet and she was unable to get out. The home was vacant, so nobody heard her crying or screaming. Benonis, the one who called this in, said he thought about the doll in the box when he heard this radio broadcast. So that's when he called the police. 
They later discovered that a man had found the body a few days before, but he was in the area checking his muskrat traps, and he did not want to report it because this was illegal, and he didn't want his traps to be exposed or to get in any kind of legal trouble. And just a little pro tip for our listeners out there. If you've got a dead body in the middle of your illegal muskrat trap field, go ahead and call the police. We can probably look past your illegal hunting to find a body. Oh, definitely. Well, the boy became dubbed as the Fox Chase Boy, but it didn't take long before he became known as the boy in the box. And this has been a case that's obviously been heard years and years and years. I, I can't even remember how long ago it was I heard about this case. And it's always called the boy in the box every time I've heard it. Well, the police, when they discovered this child, they suspected that they were soon going to get a report of a missing child. But that didn't happen. An autopsy was done on the child by Dr. John Spellman. And here's what the autopsy report said. It was a Caucasian male child, four to six years of age, 41 inches tall, his weight was 30 pounds, but he was underweight for someone that height and that age. Blue eyes, light brown to sandy blonde hair. He had four round bruises on his head. His face was pale. His lips were dry and crusted with blood. He was emaciated. Ribs were showing through the skin from being malnourished. There were no broken bones or deformities. He did have several scars, and one was near the groin area, and they suspect it was possibly a hernia surgery. There was a surgical scar on the left side of his chest, and there was an L-shaped scar on his chin, a scar on his ankle. He had a full set of baby teeth and was slightly buck-toothed. They believe he had recently received some type of eye treatment due to residue that was in his eyes. He did not have a vaccination scar. This is a time when smallpox vaccination was given and it left a noticeable scar. And if you know people that were children during this time, they can show you their vaccination scar. The scar was kind of a depressed area, less than an inch, and usually on the arm. The male child was circumcised. His fingernails and toenails had been recently trimmed. He had a possible shoe size of a child's eight. The right palm of his hand and soles of his feet were wrinkled as if he had been submerged in water just prior to or just after death. His esophagus had dark residue, which indicated vomiting shortly before death, although his stomach showed he had not eaten a few hours prior to his death. The cause of death was determined to be blunt force trauma. They believed he was a victim of beating due to the fresh bruising on the left side of his face and body. Now, around the time of this discovery of the boy in the box, the weather was cold and rainy, so it was difficult for them to determine the exact time or the date of death. The estimate was two days to two weeks prior to being found, but they say more than likely it was closer to a few days because the box was dry and not severely water damaged where it had been raining a good bit it would have shown more damage so how did the police go about identifying the boy in the box well no one came forward to report the child as theirs or a child they knew no child had been reported missing it was almost as if he never existed but the police did try several things to identify the boy in the box. And I think one of these was very unique. One of the ways that they attempted to identify the boy in the box is they actually dressed the boy's body in common clothing for children from that era, placed him in a sitting position and took photographs to distribute. And these photographs, they're on our website. 
and they are very eerie. I mean, it's it's this deceased child dressed in new clothes sitting in a chair. It is a, a very uh, unique photo, not a common technique for that type of identification, but they're working with 1957 technology. They didn't have a lot of the tools that are at law enforcement's disposal today to identify a body. And, and although it's kind of macabre, I think it's a unique and potentially effective way of identifying him. They also published photos of his face and the newspaper, the Philadelphia Inquirer, kind of as a public service, they printed a flyer dated March 8th, 1957, and they sent this flyer, 400,000 copies of it, out, and they were handed out, hung in store windows, mailed out in utility bills, and they, the community was pulling together to try to get this child identified. They ran an article in a pediatric journal describing the boy and the surgical scars, and they also broadcast his description and images to 48 states via police teletype, but still, they received nothing. So in the absence of any information about the identity of this child and they've tried these things, they kind of go back to square one and they question Frederick Bononis again. So when they question him again, they attack this, I was trying to save the rabbit from the trap story. Because like I said, this story is just got all kinds of problems. I mean, anyone would be immediately suspicious of that. And he finally admitted that he had been in the area spying on women at Good Shepherd's Girls Home. And that's kind of a home for wayward young women. He was basically a peeping Tom. He didn't want to reveal this to them initially. He was embarrassed about it. So he lied about what he was doing there. So because he had lied... And now they, they're looking at him for information about the boy in the box, and he's lied about being a peeping Tom. They polygraphed him, and he passed. A new witness came forward to say that a few days before the discovery, he saw a woman and a boy about 12 years old standing near the trunk of a car, and he asked if they needed help, and she said that she didn't, so he drove on. And that was really the only clues they had. As far as physical evidence, in the box with the child, there was a handkerchief with the letter G monogrammed on it. They noticed that the boy's hair had been recently cut. And if you look at the pictures, you can see that it's a crude cut that was done to this boy's hair. And they think that it was possibly done after death in an unskilled way, just a crude cut. And it looks like somebody tried to do a crew cut on the boy with gaps in it. They know this because there were long strands of his hair in the box with him. And I mean longer strands, not like he hadn't had a haircut in a few months, but probably a few years. They also know that this area, this thicket in these woods, was used as a dump site for garbage. And they even found rusted appliances in the area. Nearby the box, though, they found a blue corduroy men's cap, size seven and a half, with a leather strap in the back, and an inside label that read Robin's Bald Eagle Cap, Philadelphia, PA. Now, the cap was in excellent condition, so they knew it hadn't been there long. There was a large roll of paper tissue in the sweatband portion of the hat. So they're able to track this hat to the store, and they speak with the owner, Hannah Robbins. And she said it was a custom hat. It was made and purchased by a man. She didn't know his name. He was a white male, 26 to 30 years old, blonde hair. He paid in cash, and she never saw him again after the purchase. Another thing that they did was take the boy's fingerprints, which is a common technique now. Back then, not so much unless they were trying to identify somebody. Now that box, the big box that the boy was in, it had the wording on it, furniture, fragile, do not open with knife. And it was identified as one time it contained a baby's bassinet that was sold at JCPenney for $7.50. 
Now, this particular bassinet, once they trace back, I mean, they're doing a lot of footwork on this. They trace it back, and it was sold at the J.C. Penney store in Upper Darby, Pennsylvania, from December 3rd, 1956 to February 16th, 1957, and they only had 12 of them. There were no credit card receipts for the purchases, but they were able to track down most of the purchasers of the bassinet. There were no useful prints on the box. The blanket, it was a cheap cotton flannel pattern with diamonds and blocks, and it was described as a Navajo style blanket, and its color was green and rust and white. It was faded and it appeared to have recently been washed. The size of it was 64 by 76. And like I said, it, it was faded, so it was old. And it also appeared to have been mended with some poor grade cotton thread on a home sewing machine. Inside the box, they also find a small piece of this blanket soaked with automotive grease. And it was a portion just a small portion of this blanket, not sure why it had automotive grease and why it was in the box, but there was also a portion of the blanket that was completely missing, and the size of that would have been about 31 by 26 inches. They traced this blanket. Again, a lot of footwork on this. They find that the blanket was made in North Carolina or Quebec, Canada, but there were thousands of them, and they were shipped all across the U.S. The police, as Jen mentioned, are trying really, really hard to develop some leads in this case. And and I think for 1957, they're, they're doing a really good job tracking down this hat and all these other items and the bassinet, you know, and finding the people who, most of the people who purchased the bassinet, that's a big thing. That would be tough to do today with a lot more technology. In addition to what they already had done, they went to the Good Shepherd Girls' home and requested adoption records for all out-of-wedlock babies that were born there in the time frame of the boy's birth. And I don't know if they were just trying to track that this boy was returned to where he was adopted from. I don't know. That seems kind of grasping at straws to me, but they're trying. The medical examiner's investigator, Remington Bristow, stayed on on this case, basically, until his death in 1993. He initially offered a $1,000 reward from his own pocket for information about the boy in the box. Another investigator, one who took the boy's fingerprints, used his own time to go through all local hospital birth records because they took prints of babies when they were born. It took him nine years to do that, and he still didn't find a match for the prints that he obtained from the boy in the box. So possible leads that they developed about who this boy might be or tips that they received, there were several of them. First of all, there was a nearby foster home. It was about a mile and a half away from where the boy was found. And there was a boy who was the child of Anna Nicoletti, and she was the stepdaughter of Arthur Nicoletti, who was the man who ran the home. And she was said to be mentally challenged. She had had four children out of wedlock, three were stillborn, and another was accidentally electrocuted in 1955. So they go to this home questioning if she could have had another child and this had been the child. Well, Remington Bristow, the investigator we talked about, contacted a psychic who said to look for a home, and the description the psychic gave fit the description of this foster home. When they met, the psychic led him directly to the foster home. Remington Bristow said he once went to an estate sale there at the home and saw an old bassinet that resembled the J.C. Penney one plus blankets that looked similar. Another possible lead was that he was a Hungarian immigrant, but this was a specific Hungarian immigrant, and this was disproved when that child was actually located. 
At one point, there were two authors who located a man living in Memphis, Tennessee, that was possibly the brother of the boy in the box. This man's family had rented a home in Philadelphia, and it was reported that they had sold their son. They left the area not long after the news of the boy in the box broke and left behind like all their necessities and they just quickly relocated. Stephen Damon, who went missing on Halloween in 1955 in Long Island, he was two years old at the time. His mother left him and his sister outside of a grocery store while she went inside. She returns to find both children missing. The infant sister was found in her pram or her stroller only a block away, but the two-year-old was not found. In 1961, Kenneth and Irene Dudley were arrested when the body of their seven-year-old daughter was found dead in the woods in Virginia. She was wrapped in a blanket. She showed signs of abuse and malnutrition. Now, the thing about them is several of their children went missing and a few of them passed away from neglect and abuse. So they tried to connect the boy in the box back to the Dudleys, but were unable to do so. The boy was eventually buried in the city cemetery. In 1998, the boy was exhumed and they were able to extract DNA from his teeth. And like I said, this is what disproved that he had any familial links to Anna Nicoletti, you know, in the foster home and no familiar relation to that man in Memphis, Tennessee, and he was not Stephen Damon. And like I said a minute ago, they were unable to link him to the Dudleys in Virginia, but I couldn't find any information on the DNA testing for that particular family. But the strongest clue in this case came in 2002. A psychiatrist contacted the police about a client called M. M had told the psychiatrist a story. The police are able to finally meet with M and they got the story directly from her. And here is that story. M was the daughter of two school teachers. She said when she was about 10 years old, her mother went to a home and gave a woman an envelope. And the woman gave her a toddler boy. She said her parents shut the boy in the basement and did not allow him out of the house. The boy was called Jonathan. The boy never spoke a word and there was possibly something physically wrong with him or developmentally wrong. This boy was abused by her parents and she was abused by her parents. She said that Jonathan was underfed and when she was about 12, this is when the death of Jonathan happened. She said her mother had fed him baked beans and he threw them up. She put him in the bathtub to clean him up and began beating him. She slammed his head into the bathroom floor a few times. The mother cleaned him up, cut his hair, and put him in the trunk of the car. M said it was raining at the time, so she was wearing her raincoat and she was with her mother outside the car. She said a man stopped to ask if they needed help and her mother stood where the man could not see the tag on their car. Her mother shook her head no and the man drove off. She said her mother stashed Jonathan in a box that was lying nearby that was already discarded in the area. The police were able to confirm that M's family lived in Lower Marion at the time. They talked to neighbors, and no one remembered a boy in the family. But remember, M said he was kept in the basement and not allowed to be kept outside. They contacted M's college roommate. M had told this roommate that her mother had killed someone. The psychiatrist wholeheartedly believed that M was sincere about this and said that her story remained consistent for a decade. However, the police do not think that M's story is valid. They said that the details she provided are public knowledge. Even the witness statement about stopping to help was known to the public. M had been in and out of psychiatric care most of her life 
So that kind of puts a little hink in believing what she is saying. DNA wouldn't help in this case because the boy was not a blood relative to M or her parents. And M didn't know who the people were that her mom got the boy from. And her parents are both deceased, so they couldn't even talk to them. Police developed several theories regarding the boy in the box because they really have no actual leads to act on. And they surmised that his body had been transported from somewhere else and dumped, so they don't believe he was killed there. They believe that he was possibly killed by his parents or guardian and that he may have been adopted. They know that there was no match with all of the local hospital records because the investigator had taken the time to go through that, but they think that the child could have been born at home. That was still common at the time, and maybe the birth had not been reported. They felt like maybe he had been the victim of sex trafficking or had been kidnapped, and he might have been passed as a girl. The long hair in the box and the fact that his hair had recently been cut kind of pointed to that. The police also believe that the parents were poor, possibly carnival workers or migrant laborers who often traveled and would have left little or no paper trail to track them or the boy. And all these theories, I mean, it's just that's all they have because I, they have nothing else to go on. I mean, it's all kind of a shot in the dark. And in March of 2016, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children released a forensic facial reconstruction of the boy to kind of put it out there to see if anybody else knew anything. And the case was eventually looked at by the Vidoc Society. And we've talked about them in the podcast before, but as a little brief refresher for our listeners, the Vidoc Society was named for Eugene Vidoc and he was a French criminal turned criminalist. Frank Bender, we mentioned him in the John List episode, is a forensic artist and was one of the co-founders of the Vidoc Society. They began to look at the case, but they also haven't developed any real concrete answers. The boy in the box was reinterred in a donated plot in a local cemetery on November 11th, 1998 with a memorial service, and they actually had a headstone there that, that says, America's Unknown Child. He has kind of become an iconic symbol of all the abused and neglected children that tend to slip through the cracks but are not forgotten. For 64 years, people have been looking for him, and there are still many people who are searching for the identity of America's unknown child. The Vidoc Society, like we mentioned before, is looking for information, and they still hold a memorial service for him every year. This is a sad case, and what's even sadder is that he hasn't been identified, and here we are, like we said, 64 years later, so anybody that might have information about who he may be or have anything to move this case forward are, are on up in years. I mean, they're, they're getting older, and we're losing any information. I mean, it's a very sad case, but like you said, it's kind of become the symbol for the abused and neglected children that we don't want to forget as an American society that we have to protect these children. And take a look at the supporting materials that we put on our website or on the YouTube video. And I mean, who knows? We say it every week. Take a look at the stuff. You, you or someone you know may have information about this. I mean, I've seen strange things happen. I mean, people... They don't think they know something, but then they see a picture or something and it sparks this memory or something they heard or any lead the police would be interested in and tracking down regarding this case. I mean, even show the pictures to your grandmothers and granddaddies or great grandmothers and granddaddies. Sure. Well, we hope you enjoyed this week's case. And as always, we'll see you next week. We would like to hear your thoughts on this and all of our cases. And as always, you can reach us by email at truecrimeoutloud at gmail.com, Facebook and Instagram at truecrimeoutloud. Outloud is two words, not one, and Twitter at TCOutloud. 
Photos, links, and sources for this case can be found on our website at www.truecrimeoutloud.com.